My name is Monk Rowe, and we're in Buffalo, New York, filming for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive. I'm very pleased to have Bobby Militello with me today. I've been looking forward to uh, talking to you because you see the music business from at least two sides. At least, yeah. Yeah. Whatever possessed you to uh, become a player first? Well, I mean, I've always had the, the talent or the thing about playing, but uh, mm -hmm. When I was uh, in fourth grade, my mother took me to see the Benny Goodman story. Mm -hmm. The next day, the next day, went to school, asked for, you know, could I take clarinet lessons? Yeah. And we were pretty poor, and uh, so the school gave me a clarinet, and uh, it started with that. Wow. Was, yeah. it a, was it a metal one? or a, yeah. A, Oh, yeah, yeah, it was a metal clarinet, and uh, it was actually uh, um, an old boucher which I wish I still had, Yeah. <laughs> even though it was the metal one. I mean, it still wouldn't mind having that. You know, they make good lamps, too. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I hate that. When I go to somebody's house and there's a violin on the wall or a, <laughs> or a saxophone with a light coming out of the yeah. bell, it's like, oh, oh, you know. So <laughs> one of those, like... <laughs> it's just very interesting, you know, that you mentioned that movie and people get their inspirations from interesting places. Mm-hmm. Did, were you aware of that type of music Jazz? before and oh, swing yeah. oh, before yeah. you saw that? Without a question, yeah. Okay. Our house, my mother was, uh, God rest her soul, my mother was into jazz. Mm. And so we, were, we grew up on uh, listening to jazz all the time in the house. And although uh, uh, we didn't get the stereo really until I was about, uh, oh, I'd say, yeah, six or six or seven years old. Then we finally got a stereo. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it was a little radio. And uh, uh, we listened to jazz all the time. And then here in Buffalo, we had uh, Sunday afternoons. There was Sinatra and Strings. There was WEBR that had jazz all the time. Uh, and uh, uh, with Joe Rico, who was a great jazz disc jockey mm -hmm. at that time. And so we always listened to jazz in the house. And as my brothers got older, because I was the baby, as everybody got older, we were introduced into a little bit of R&B type jazz, you know, the Lou Rawls and things like that, and those kind of things. But basically, it was just the context in the house was always jazz. Specifically, whom? Oh, or, or well, on the kind? radio, it was everybody. Oh. Uh, but uh, the first introductions I had, the first album, I believe, was Maynard Ferguson's Live at Newport in 50. Mm -hmm. uh, and... Uh, Boy, I can still scat all of the tunes off that record. <laughs> I mean, I love that record. What a band that was! That's, oh that man, small, Jimmy big Ford, band. And yeah, all the cats, yeah. I mean, that was a that was one hell of a band. And then uh, Take Five, uh, you know, the uh, Time Out album. Yeah, that was the other one that I got. And uh, then we just started buying a whole bunch of things. And of course, we had this whole entourage of Sinatra albums. And you know, when you're listening to like Nelson Riddle and Duke Ellington and all this stuff, I mean. It's, you're catching the vibe of exactly what this is about. And then they just started, uh, there used to be a label, Premier, which as I found out later, exploited all of the cats that they oh. recorded. Uh, but they had 89, in the 89 cent bin in the uh, um, uh, drugstores oh, and right. things like that. You could find Premier labeled records and it was everybody, Conti Condoli, I had the first album when I got to play with Conti with Doc Severinsen and Tonight Show Band, um, Conti had told me that was the first album him and his brother recorded. And uh, um, of course they got you know screwed royal on uh -huh. basically what happened with it. But they got an album out and did what they did. And there was a whole bunch of Herbie Mann stuff. Uh, uh, one album I bought, Herbie Mann and Sam Most. Oh yeah. You remember that album? Yeah. Well, an interesting little thing about that is uh, um, a, a bunch of the solos that say they're Herbie Mann are actually Sam No Most. kidding. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> he wanted to sound better on Elto. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of out. They say it was a mistake in the liner notes. Yeah, yeah. it was. I'm sure it was a mistake. Yeah. All right. <laughs> but uh, we just started developing these things and... Uh, these this record collection, my mother would buy them when she saw them, and I would buy them when I saw them, and uh, I would, uh, oh, later on we got this Sears Silvertone stereo, 
mm -hmm. which is the f stereo, man, it yeah. was so cool. And I would lay down in front of this thing and just lift the arm up when you still had the arm on the record player. And I would put the record on and listen to it over, over, over again, this the one side, and I would just lay on the floor between the two speakers. And I would sort of get into a trance, didn't even realize what I was doing to myself, but I was programming my computer with licks mm -hmm. and I could scat everything that I heard. So I was, I, I was actually scatting them out loud. So basically I was working on my vocal chops, with not even knowing I was doing that. Uh -huh. I was just grooving, you know, and I felt like I was inside the chart because I could sing the lick and do everything. Later on, my mother uh, used to encourage me to sit there after I'd practiced because I had a very uh, old school teacher, John Sedola. He was a great teacher, absolutely great teacher, and uh, probably one of the best I've ever known or ever heard of mm -hmm. for saxophone. He taught Don Menza and a whole bunch of different cats, uh, Mike Migliori in New York and a bunch of guys. But um, he used to make us practice about six hours a day in order to complete the lesson in a week. You'd have to do six hours, including Sundays, the whole bit. You couldn't play football, couldn't do anything wow. else. You only could do music uh -huh. if you wanted to be with him. So at the end of that six hours, now it was time that I could just do what I wanted to do. And so now I would go out and put a record on and memorize solos and play along with the tunes. And my mother, at the time, would take the time to sit there in a chair and listen to me blow. And while I was blowing, the first album that I really memorized everything of was uh, Stan Getz's uh, Astro Gilberto, mm -hmm. a Desi Fanata, and all that stuff on it. So you were learning his solos? I was playing. learning his solo verbatim. Wow. I'm talking about inu just little, uh, um, you know, in lip glisses. Inflections and, and all those and things. All the inflections yeah. and the licks and the ghosted notes and the things that you do to make it sound like emotional. And my mother would sit there and I had it down. I mean, I had, I had that whole side of the record, every cut down that I could just play it along with him exactly the way it was going. But my mother would sit there and say, ah, today you're just going through the motion. And then another day she'd sit there with a smile on her face and say, you're playing that solo. You're actually playing the solo. She could hear the difference. I mean, it was really amazing. She could actually hear the difference between when you were inside and playing it. And so she used to sit there and, you know, oh, if you're going to go through the motion, you might as well just stop. And That's amazing that you had two real <laughs> taskmasters. You know, you had your, yeah. your, I assume that John Sedola was teaching you classical yes. repertoire. That's right. His whole thing was in the lesson, you only sound like him. He doesn't want you to sound like you or anyone else. You sound like him only. Wow. And you, you cop and the idea was that he was teaching you an umbrasure control situation that when you really had it down and you knew what you were doing, you sound like anybody you want or do anything mm -hmm. you wanted to do. It's just a matter of adjusting the inside chamber of your throat or the way you grip the mouthpiece and you just change your sound. And that's, you know, so he was a real, like I said, a taskmaster. He and you looked at him like a sensu in karate or something. Mm -hmm. You just your whole purpose for doing well was to satisfy him, and you respected him to no end. And everybody who took lessons with him felt this exactly the same way. I mean, just to get in to take lessons with him. He was one of those cats. Uh, the one time I I was playing football and I uh, uh, for the Lafayette Lafayette High School team. And uh, I was a tackle, and uh, I sprained this finger, and I couldn't practice that week. So I came in, but I was a good sight reader. So I came in, and I'm going through the thing and everything else. And Sedola says, uh, "You know, he says uh, you didn't really practice." I says, "Yeah, I didn't practice. I, I sprained this finger, you know, and everything." He says, "Oh, okay." He says, "Well, give me the ten dollars." That's how much it was at the time. I gave yeah. him the ten dollars. He says, "Okay." He says, "Now go home, just do the same lesson again. Just practice. Just this time practice." He says, "I know you can read, but you have to practice the ten times this, twenty times that. But you have to practice it. So go home and practice. And incidentally, uh, it's either football or me." The next morning, I handed him my uniform, which really um, uh, made the. Uh, the football coach mad because big guy tackle you know, right. good for the team 
funny anecdote is that, uh, what, 20, 25 years later, I'm playing with Brubeck with the Buffalo Symphony. It sold out. In this, about the fifth row is, uh, I forget his first name, but Rosenbaum. That was his, that was our coach. He's in the fifth row sitting there. <laughs> so afterwards, I come out to get my horn stands, you know, and pick the stuff up off the stage like I usually do at the concert. He comes up, he says, you made the right decision. <laughs> That's cool, man. And I shook his head. I said, I know. I know I did. <laughs> that is a It was story, really man. cool, man. It was real cool. When did you start making a connection between the solos you were learning by ear and playing so well, the connection with the harmonies that, was going, that were going on underneath? Wow. Uh, I'd say sometime in high school, in this maybe sophomore year, somewhere around there, there was a point where I was playing with an accordion trio. We were playing a lot of weddings, mm -hmm. doing that kind of a thing. The guy played quarter box, the organ type yeah. accordion, but before that, regular accordion. And I used to like that, our, uh, Van Damme and all those cats. Yeah. I used to dig the sound. There was a fullness to it that I, that I liked. So in any event, uh, uh, we were doing all these weddings and what we would do is get together on Thursdays. We'd practice for two hours and then watch I Spy. <laughs> right? That was our routine <laughs> every Thursday. So uh, what we would do is open up a fake book, start reading every tune. You know, there used to be three on a page in the old fake books. Right. So you'd start reading and we'd play through every single tune, just go through the A's and the B's and the C's and the D's and then go back and start over again, uh, you know, week after week, so that when we went to a job, we could interpret these tunes that we didn't know when somebody asked for them, so we could make them sound like something. And also, feeding the computer tunes. Mm -hmm. Well, in it, inadvertently, by feeding the computer tunes, you're also feeding it changes. And finding out, oh, that's the same as this, oh, that's the same as this, oh, that's the same as this, oh, that'll work instead of that because it uh, accomplishes the same, hmm. let's say a two five, except different. You know, it's a different way to get into the same one chord. Cool, all right, we could do that in that tune. We could do this in that tune. Well, uh, I went home and I had gotten, someone had donated a piano uh, that I could have at the house, you know, and I had a piano. And then one day I'm playing blues changes and then I realized, wait a minute, no, wait a minute. You can do this and you can do that. And I, I started writing out all the alternate changes that I could play on the blues. And uh, realized at that point, wait a minute, just because it says C7 doesn't mean I have to play a C7. There are a whole <laughs> bunch of different things that I can play on that chord. That was my first revelation, which got me to then Joey Azzarello uh, as a rela, great piano player. Yes. And Joey gave, started to give me theory lessons and the Mohegan book and started to say, well, this is what you found out. This is sort of what that is and this is what the mm -hmm. substitute changes represent from, you know, your theory. And so we started going through that thing. I had never really followed that through real far. I think I studied with him for about six months. But the idea was that my head opened up to a new process, and that was that I never had to just blatantly play what was in front of my face, because that truly is a jazz. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you always try and interpret it. So uh, <clears throat> after that point, as you uh, uh, picked up on a little while ago, I'm very much an ear player. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what it was now, the process was, listen to other things, listen to train listen to uh, um, Cannonball, which I listen a lot to Cannonball. Yeah. I mean, I even want to, I, I, I think I sound <laughs> like Cannonball, uh -huh. I, or I try to. I, yeah. That's the sound in my mind's ear that I try and achieve, is that roundness and that beautiful shaped centered tone, you know. So, I mean, I try and do that. And uh, um, through hearing them blowing on tunes, 
and listening and listening and listening, you know, more and more. And then later, Hubert Laws and listening to how he transcended anything having to do with just the normal change that was being played. And then listening to piano players who, while they comped, the better players, McCoy and those cats and, uh, and uh, Bill Evans and the different people behind cats, so Bill Evans behind Miles and Train and all that kind of stuff. When you listen to Red Garland when he first was starting to do what he was doing, you're hearing the fact that no longer did they give you the root. They skipped the root out, <laughs> they, they pulled that root out and they went third and seven in the left hand sometimes and then just the upper extension in the right hand. So in the key of C, if you're playing a C7, they might play a D triad in the right hand and just, you know, E and B flat down here. And what happens is when you do this, there's the key, there's the D change to play on, there's the C7 to play on, but because there's no root, you've got multiple changes to play on from the left hand, mm -hmm. and you've got multiple play, uh, changes to play on because you've got a new key here, you've got the left hand key, which is not giving you the key of C, so you've got a whole bunch you can play on there. All of a sudden, I'm listening to this and saying, Revelation, mm. wait a minute, there is really no wrong note. Technically, there is no wrong note. You play anything. It's where you're going or where you came from. Mm -hmm. So now, get the ear to understand that. Get the ear, but you know, the limitations are when you play with a piano player who doesn't play with a freedom to give you those voicings. Right. that my ears say the notes that I'm going to play that normally would be right with a piano player knows what he's doing <laughs> or no piano player at all, right? Now, my ear says, no, no, you can't do that now because he's stopping you. Right. Okay, which, which is a pet peeve of, of a lot of soloists. And that's the piano player can put you in a box. I see. You know, you can do that really easy, you yeah. know. So, so, but that's when I learned it. I would say that was in high school. I was playing strip shows at that time. I was working six nights a week as a sophomore in high school wow. doing the strip shows at McVans. And uh, my teacher, the guy had a heart attack, that uh, Joey Camara uh, had a heart attack, and they needed somebody right away. And my teacher got the call from Hill Munter, who was this piano player who I learned a lot from. Oh, what a great guy he was, too. Terrific cat he mm -hmm. was. And uh, he recommended me. He says, look, he hasn't got the experience, but he'll cut it right up. I mean, he's a great player. So they hired me. And at that time, I was 16. I was legal to do mm -hmm. that as long as I was working. Uh, you got a work permit and you could work, you know. So I went out and did this thing and uh, six nights a week. And uh, besides getting a few uh, uh, bras thrown in my face because the chicks always like to fool with you because yeah. when you're young <laughs> and, and, you know, doing their shtick to you, you yeah. know, that whole bit. Besides that kind of a thing, Hill taught me how to read a show. And I don't mean a show where you, like, like when I go out and do Natalie Cole and everything yeah. is clear and very succinct. And right. Watch the conductor, it's marked right, everything is cool. It's also copied very well. I mean, I played in Bill Holman's band for five years, so I look at his charts, I know what they are. I, I know how to play a Bill Holman chart just by looking at it. Uh -huh. Because I, you know, Bob Florence, same thing. But I'm looking at those charts, everything is cool. But when you go to read a strip show, where this stripper has been on the road for, oh, 20 years, or the comedian's been out for 30 years, Johnny Maine and all these cats that I backed up, their books are like t torn corners, arrows down, yeah. scratch this out, put in two extra notes over here, do this, do that, bar, bar, you know. Yeah. <laughs> A seg to, and then a name of a tune, right. and what key they wanted, right. and this, and backup vocalist, don't back up vocalist, what, but you, and you're, so you're reading words, you're reading tunes, you're knowing tunes that you have to insert yes. on, on an automatic level, and you're interpreting this chart that you can barely even right. see. And Hill just would teach me to relax, he said, this is what you do, and you know, you go through this number, and, uh, um, and I got it down, I mean, I was very good at it. And I knew all the tunes, you know, playing Temptation, uh, for a stripper was just remembering what I heard Earl Bostic, how he mm -hmm. played it. That's how mm -hmm. I played it. I put the growl in there yeah. the whole thing and just played it like, and people used to flip. I bet you learned to project in that situation. Well, sure. <laughs> well, Sedola gave us the projection. Yeah. There's no, yeah, his whole thing was, you know, forget them. I used to go to country clubs to hear him play uh, weddings and things like yeah. that. 
and you would walk into a country club that uh, the room was 300, 400 feet long, and it's one of those typical country r club rooms. He's at the other side of the room. I'd walk in the door, and you could hear him clear as a bell on the other side of the room with uh, 500 people mm -hmm. milling around and doing whatever. You just hear his sound clear as a bell. His thing was projection. Matter of fact, uh, when we when we would play in the practice room together, um, the other teachers, when the two of us would play together <laughs> duets and really give it some, the other teachers sometimes would have to stop teaching because we would just vibrate so much that they would say they just couldn't do They had to stop. They just couldn't deal wow. with it. One of us at a time was okay, but the two <laughs> and the, the extra vibration, they just couldn't deal with it. So, well, yeah, he taught the projection and... And uh, which is something I've always said to the kids when we do clinics and that uh, with Dave and Maynard and everything else. You gotta forget about that microphone. The mm -hmm. microphone is a tool that happens later. Yeah. Right now, your whole purpose is to send that sound just like a public speaker looks at the exit sign in the back and that's his focal point. Right. You know, you've gotta send your sound out sure. there with that kind of a feeling. If you don't, there's always this weakness. You never fit in a section. You never work mm. in a section. It mm. doesn't sound right. You can never yeah. blend with the lead player. You can never do this. You never, yeah. Yeah. Well, microphones only going to project what you put into it, and if you don't put in yeah. something good, that's yeah, yeah. But you need the, to have the center in what you do. You mm -hmm. need you need to think acoustic. Yeah. Right. You can't think uh, electronic. Oh. You have to think acoustic. Was your mother cool with you playing uh, strip shows? Mm hmm. That's good. Well, remember, again, my, uh, we were fairly poor, yeah. and I'm the baby, and so my, my sister had moved out by then, and brother uh, Charlie had moved out by then, and uh, Michael was just about to move out. And so uh, bringing in 160 a week, and sophomore in high school, yeah, uh, helped out a lot, yeah. and uh, I had my own car, and, you know, I, I mean... Things like that. I mean, it was a pretty good situation. Did you have trouble getting up in the morning? <coughs> Once in a while. She, <laughs> she threw water on me a couple of times. Yeah, she actually did that a couple of times. You got to get up, you got to go to school. So then I got a pact with, again, one of the major influences in my, in, in my life was uh, Sam Skamaka, my high school. Uh, Samaka? Skamaka. Skamaka. Yeah, S C A M A C C A. Yeah. Um, Sam was cool. Sam was great. And uh, he ended up being the principal there, retired as principal a whole bit. But uh, uh, when I would go to school, Sam basically said, okay, we got uh, history of music, first period, uh, uh, such as whatever other music course, second period, and then you got gym. Well, he'd give me a note for gym and then let me sleep through my first two classes only under the guise that I would get no less than 100 on the tests. He says, you know a lot of this. The theory stuff, you uh -huh. know it already. He says, Adola gave it to you. You already know it. He says, and uh, the history of music, you have to read. As long as you get 100 on your <laughs> test, not 99, 100, that means I can read it all. You know, and then you can sleep through these, you can sleep through the first periods. So he would let me stay in the back of the music room and just sleep on the desk. <laughs> and That's an he, open would, mind. he would let me out of gym all the time. He would get yeah. me out of gym constantly. As a matter of fact, that was the thing between him and Jim. Sure. And Jim. But, uh, uh, and then the other prerequisite with Sam was uh, that I show up on time for the uh, variety shows. Oh. Because we had, well, do you know who Ronnie Foster is? Yeah. Yeah, well, Ronnie was in the school I with see. us. He was playing in the school. We had Joey Gata, who's a guitar player that's out in L.A., who's done uh, at least 10 albums or so. And uh, uh, Jerry Panzico, who's died recently, but he was out in L.A. and a great drummer. And uh, so we had a um, hell of a pit band. I mean, really good pit band. And Sam is a horn player, mm -hmm. but he was an aspiring uh, piano player. So he would play piano with us. Or Ronnie Foster would do it at certain points in time. Matter of fact, Ronnie Foster and I used to skip out of school during lunch and go over to uh, my brother's place. He had a place uh, around the corner. It was like a teen nightclub, and there was always a B3 there. 
and Ronnie and I would go and blow for a couple of hours, and then we'd come, because I had the keys, and then we'd come back to school. You know, it was kind of hip. <laughs> so uh, Sam, his other prerequisite was that you were on time for, the, uh, for all of the things, choir, uh, you had to sing in the choir because mm -hmm. he needed in tune voices <laughs> and uh, all this kind of stuff. So we did all of it, you know, and he kept us busy. I mean, we had the orchestra. I had to play flute and cl or clarinet and orchestra and then everything else. A couple of times, uh, I remember one variety show where I showed up about uh, 45 minutes late, something like that, and came right in, sat right down, and the look he gave me, oh. <laughs> yeah. And that was the last. He says, you want what you got, you got to pay for it. Right. This is, right. this is the last time, and that's the last time I think I was ever late on him. I used to have to play taps because we didn't have a trumpet player that could play taps. So on Memorial Day when we go to the park, I'd bring my alto and just hold down low B flat and use the harmonic overtone series. And I was so egotistical even then that I told him I would only use the school horn because I didn't play my horn outside. <laughs> <laughs> what if it rained? <laughs> well, that's funny. I never heard anybody doing that. You know. Oh, I, I, I've, I guess I've, I remembered in the practice rooms <coughs> saxophone players doing that, but I never heard actually. Yeah, it's it actually anything. a good method for uh -huh. teaching intonation and mm -hmm. umbrasure position. Yeah. It's a great. That's part of what I had to do with Sedola, was uh, uh, do that kind of a thing and be able to get to the third partial level where you can play pretty much play diatonic melodies up in the third partial, and. Uh, he would have me do this on low B flat, lip slur them with no articulation, which was hard. And eventually, just your control of that finite positioning of your embouchure, because oh. he'd make you put your bottom lip over your bottom teeth when you did this. Sure. So it was sort of both lips, and it was very hard to do, but it really gave you finite control of like how your embouchure opened and closed. It's wow. pretty so. What was your first... Uh, is there a time or a circumstance that you considered a break, a big break for you? Uh, well, it depends on what we're talking about, a big break. The first time I soloed that I felt like I actually played a real mm -hmm. solo that came from me was about 16 years old in a bar on uh, Grant and Ferry around the corner from my house with an R&B band. Oh, it must have made an impression on you at the time, if and you didn't remember too. that. Right? And them too. <laughs> I remember yeah. just the whole night. I wow. can still see that room right now, yeah. Oh. Things like that you just never, ever forget. Plateaus, when you crack yeah. those certain plateaus, never forget them. Mm -hmm. At least I haven't, uh, yeah. all of them. I can remember all the points where I found out the switch moved. I just moved a level. Yeah. And this was my first one to play a solo that I felt was like appropriate, imaginative, and the whole bit. And even the cats that night, I mean, just when the set was over, they were all like, whoa, yeah. man. Yeah, great. You're burning, man. Perfect. I walked out of there like, I keep using the analogy that it's like uh, when you get out of confession, that feeling that you have when you walk outside and everything smells fresh. Uh. You know, and, and, and everything looks great. That's the kind of feeling that I had. When I walked out that door, it was like, <laughs> cool, man. I'm a player, man. You know, it's one of those type of numbers, you know. Uh, the first big break. See, I don't know you, whether you equate the big breaks to the big name Names, people yeah. or whether you equate them to circumstances and mm -hmm. things that had a, uh, an important impact on your life. Um, first big break. When I was with the New Wave, actually the New Wave was a big break. That was a band uh, in the uh, 70s. And uh, all we did for a year that I was with them was rehearse, write new tunes, new charts, play the ch stuff that uh, Tommy Sapienza wrote for us. And we were doing, we had a vocalist that could scat great, Barbie, Barbie Rankin. Uh, she could scat great, sang, sang really well, and uh, would learn her parts just like any other horn player would. And we started doing like Ella charts and all these hip things, the stuff from uh, Nancy Wilson Cannonball album. Oh, my favorite. Yeah, we started doing all those charts. Uh -huh. uh, Sap wrote them all out. And uh, then I started, and myself and Dave Chavone, when he was with us, another saxophone player here in Buffalo, 
uh, started transcribing uh, some of the tunes from Phil Wood's albums, and we'd write out his solo and then give it to her to learn, and then we'd write them in three parts, Whoa. and then we'd have alto, tenor, and vocal, and we'd play them, or we'd do just like uh, John Dankworth and Cleo Lane, where you'd play the unison line with the scattered vocal. And then we started doing flute on top, adding this thing to and we were like grooving. I mean, we were really like looking for it there. Mm -hmm. Long hangs at the house every night till late in the morning, rapping about jazz, doing everything else. All the big jazz players that would come into town ended up over the house for a hang. Uh, and we were working a lot, and we'd actually move the grand piano to our gigs when we got them. We had a Baldwin baby grand wow. that Tommy had, and we'd have it moved. And that's if we had six, it was, most of the gigs were six nights a week then. If we had more than two weeks, we would move the piano at our expense. We had our own tuner that would come to tune it and the whole bit. You guys were serious. Yeah, and we weren't making any money at all. Mm -hmm. I think I made five grand that whole year. Yeah. And I learned more and broke more pl plateaus in soloing and the understanding of jazz during that thing, a period, I think, almost during any period of my life. We were yeah. working at it, and we were grooving, absolutely grooving, and it was a great thing. During that period is when Maynard heard us at uh, opening up for uh, at the Landmark, which was a big bowling alley, but Maynard was playing in the banquet room there here in Buffalo, mm -hmm. and we were opening up for him, and uh, he heard us there, and actually first needed an alto player, so he called Mike McLeory, who was with the band with New Wave too. And uh, so Mike went out there, and not even three months later, Bruce Johnston decided to split. So then Mike calls me up. He says, hey, man, you want to play with Maynard? He says, well, hell yeah, man. I dreamed about it when yeah. I was a kid. Yeah, sure, I want the gig. He says, I'm Barry. <laughs> I says, oh, man. All right, I'll do it. So I went and borrowed a Barry, because I never played Barry. I was always alto, tenor, soprano, flute, clarinet. So I borrowed a Barry. I knew I could do it. I, I mean, I, there was no, uh, it was a saxophone. I, yeah. Uh, so I borrowed a Barry and went out, got the gig instantly. So then I went, he said, the next tour starts in two weeks and such and such, New York. So I flew to New York a day early, went to Manny's, but they had two Barrys, one with a low A, one without. I said, I'll take the one without. Because <laughs> I hated the low A Barrys. I hated the balance of the horn. Uh. Didn't play bop real well. Yeah. <laughs> didn't feel right. Uh -huh. So I bought the one with the B flat. Maynard said that was cool. Didn't have to worry about it. All the writers hated me because they all wrote, wrote low A's. Sure. <coughs> well, yeah, it didn't bother me either. So uh, um, I started playing Barry with Maynard. And uh, that it was a childhood dream. That and playing with Brubeck were both childhood dreams. And uh, so uh, that was really my first big break as far as now playing with someone yeah. big. Be previous to that, in Buffalo here, I had gotten to play with uh, back up Ella Fitzgerald and, and uh, uh, Tony Bennett. Tony Bennett. Uh, there's, there's a gig. There, there's one for the books right there. Again, experiences you'll never, ever forget in your life. I walk in, the section is basically Sedola is in the section, but it's all Sedola students. Tony Carreri, myself, Vic Chioto, uh, Russell D'Alba, and somebody else. It was all Sedola students, okay? I'm playing the tenor chair. This is when something and all those students were out, right? That big album that he yeah. had. He ain't got a, th I don't mean to think of it, he ain't got that swing, all that stuff. So, uh, I got the tenor chair, and I've got a alto flute double, a flute double, and a clarinet double. Who walks out to conduct us is Tori Zito. Whoa. I'm saying, like, oh, well, this is cool, man. So we start to do the rehearsal. Tori stops the orchestra. He says, who's the sound technician here? And the guy raises his hand and says, okay, strike every microphone except for the solo microphone for the sax player and for Tony. What do you mean? He said, Man, take a break, orchestra, because it's a full orchestra gig. Take a break. He wants this gig 100% acoustic. And he doesn't like what the guy, strike everything. So they strike everything off the stage, two mics. Now we come back to do the thing and we start to play. And, if, and of course, a good conductor is going to play something to find out what 
the soloist can do. He's got to know before he gets into mm -hmm. the gig. So we started off with something. And uh, I'm sitting in the middle of that orchestra. And we start to play the chart. And I can barely play because it's so beautiful. And I can hear the changes so clear. I mean, every nuance, every moving part, I can hear it clear as a bell because it's acoustic. So I can hear everything mm -hmm. in my position. So now it gets up to back up Tony on something. And, and I start to blow. Can I swear? Of course. Is that okay? <laughs> I just say, fuck the changes. I'm not going to look at the book. I know the tune. Uh -huh. You know, let this work. Let it do what it does. So I start to blow. And I'm in freaking heaven. As a matter of fact, in my mind, Tony's in my way. I want to blow out the whole thing. <laughs> He's, you know, it's one of those type of yeah. numbers. So I play, and then I play the solo, and instead of playing the written solo there, I just blow. I take my shot. Mm -hmm. We finish the tune. Tony turns around. <laughs> he just looks at me. Tori looks at me. He says, okay, before we even do this, we got to open this up over here. We got to open this up over here. Let the kid play over here. Do this and that. I'm wow. like 17. Whoa, you're 17? I'm flipping out. Man. He's I'm opening losing. up the charts and for Sindola you. And Sedola's sitting there like, <laughs> <laughs> he's never, you know what I mean? He's my kid. I mean, yeah. He's my boy. You know? <laughs> That's super. That's a time you never forget wow. in your life. Yeah. Never, ever. I was high as a kite. I felt extraordinarily good, mm. you know. And there was different, like backing up Ella, Nancy Wilson, a couple other people. There was those points in time when you get up to blow, and uh, uh, not that long ago, five years ago, when I did Rosemary Clooney with uh, Sam Noto, mm -hmm. the two of us with Joe Cacuzzo and all the cats from New York, we did it at Art Park. And uh, I was on tenor on that gig, and we're in rehearsal, and we start to blow and read through the tunes and do the stuff, and then they get to the soloing behind her or with her, whatever the case might be, and she turns around and says, You've been with me my whole life. Oh. Wow. <laughs> I'm like, cool, I'm doing the gig. <laughs> yeah. Again, you know, that's exactly what you want to know. Yeah. You feel, that vocalist feels comfortable. She right. feels like she's in her element because I'm playing the style of the chart. It's another thing I've done my whole life. Yeah, well, that takes I a don't lot of musicality. And, yeah, just blow arbitrarily mm -hmm. because I'm a cool jazz player and I can play outside, so I'm going to play that way on her chart. You know, if you hired me, I, you hired me to play the way I play. I play the chart the way the chart feels the era, the writer, the mood, the vocalist. That's the way you try and interpret a chart. Mm -hmm. That's the important way to play. And so uh, you draw on a lot from that. I mean, I had all the years of listening to Cats Blow, Ben Webster, all the different guys. If you're going to play the right way on a thing, mm -hmm. when she's got a sexy little ballad that she wants to sing and she wants that mood set for her and also Mark Murphy taught me a long time I used to sit in with Mark because he used to play here in Buffalo it's just like a second home to him and Mark would let me sit in and I, and Mark you can't just like try and blow in the spaces because Mark fills him in he fills in his he's a horn player as much as a vocalist uh -huh. so you learn how to stay out of the way but enhance the melody. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's a counterline instead of trying to blow just a, a new melody that sits underneath and just gives them like like orchestrators do. Yeah. So when I back up a vocalist that's the kind of way I try and interpret. I don't try and just stick in jot licks. Rather try and become part of the composite. Mm -hmm. And uh, she dug it a lot. I mean we had a great time that night. It wow. was like just super time that night. So, I mean, there's been different things that, would, that I would say are the breaks. Uh, getting the gig with Maynard, that was like I was elated, absolutely elated, and I was happy as hell. I ended up to be his road manager uh -huh. uh, for uh, three of the four years that I was with him and did a lot for him that way, too. And I loved him t today as much as I loved him the first day I joined him and before I knew him. 
And, uh, uh, but at one point there, Migs left, Migliori left, and I asked if I could move to the alto chair, and he loved, he wanted me on oh. Barry, so I said no. Then he, then uh, uh, Eric Traub left, and I asked if I could move to the tenor chair, you know, I want to keep you on Barry. That was the last drop. Eric I, Traub. I, yeah. There's uh, a name that I know from Fredonia. Yeah, his nickname, be Zembo darned. Mosk. Which, what? Zembo Mosk. Yeah. Yes, because really? that was the gig that we played when he first got on the band. That was the first gig. The Zembo, some mosque in oh somewhere. Okay. And we nicknamed I him see. that gig. But um, when I knew that I was destined to play Barry forever with Maynard, I gave him my notice and said yeah. I had to leave. And uh, we left great friends, too. Yeah. There was no hassle there at all. How does he keep up physically with what he does? Um, I don't know. He's, he's, he's very into his yoga and his thing that he does that way and all that mm -hmm. stuff. And uh, I don't know. He's a road rat. I mean, his road rats tend to be able to deal with the road and the, uh, the turmoils and the, the, the physical stress and, this, and that kind of a, you know, stuff. Um, you know, I'm a heavy guy and everything else, and our schedule with Dave is just busy as hell. Mm. And yet, uh, you, you tend to deal with it, you figure it out, you make it work. He's done well. I mean, he's, he's in pretty good shape. He's gained a little weight, but the uh, you know, last time I saw him, I said, it looks good on you, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, he's, he's always been on diets and done things and stuff like that, but uh, yeah. he seems to be in pretty good shape. But, you know, getting the gig with Maynard and then leaving Maynard, uh, uh, I did a, gear, a gig for a year in Florida after I left Maynard uh, with uh, Dick Fidelli, a local guy, and again did an album with him that's great and a bunch of things. And then after that came back and started a fusion band in Buffalo. And about two years into having the fusion band, Rick James used to come to see me all the time mm -hmm. and uh, bring his whole band in because he said, listen to the precision of these guys playing. I mean, a quintet sounds like freaking a big band a lot of time because we'd write everything out I and see. everything was very precise. During that period of time is when I got a phone call from Brubeck. It was 1981 actually and uh, I remember being in the house and my wife is in the other room cooking something or whatever and I get a call and I pick up the phone and I says, hi is uh, Bobby Militello there? I says, yeah. So uh, this is Dave Brubeck. <laughs> I said, yeah. Who is this? It was one of those typical things. This is Dave Brubeck. I'm calling you from New York. Okay, what do you want? Because <laughs> I'm still figuring something's coming at me, yeah, you know. Yeah. Well, we want you to come and uh, audition for the band, if you would, in New York next, uh, you know, week. I needed a horn player. I said, oh, yeah, how did you get my name? He says, well, he says, you remember playing the Sugarbush Jazz Festival in uh, 1977? Oh, my. I says, with Maynard Ferguson? I says, yeah. All of a sudden, I'm realizing uh, there's some truth in who this is on the phone. And he says, yeah. He says, well, you played that flute solo? He says, well, my wife was out in the crowd, and she heard you came back to get me. I came out and only heard the last... 30 seconds, maybe a minute of your solo, but 20,000 people stood up and cheered when you finished. And they said, that sort of said something, you know, but my wife said you were a phenomenal player. So we wrote your name down in the book that day, our day book. We went back, went oh. through seven or eight years of day books until we found oh. your name, called up Maynard and asked him where you were and gave us your number in Buffalo. I says, all right. He says, so would you want to come? I says, yes. <laughs> Went there. He sent me a book of tunes, uh, new tunes that uh, they were doing. Of course, they weren't doing all the old quartet yeah. stuff. But when I go to when I go to do the audition, they were preparing for a gig they had to do in New York, and who's there is Joe Morello and and Eugene Wright. No kidding. So I walk into the original quartet. Oh, my movie, God. Which is like a dream. I mean, again, yeah. I memorized all those Desmond things and yeah. all that stuff. And <clears throat> so uh, I walked in and had done my homework on the new tunes, but uh, didn't have to do my homework on the old tunes. I already knew. So uh, Dave says, well, uh, what do you want to play? I says, well, Dave, anything you want. Anything you want to play. 
And he, he tells this in his interviews now to people. And then you want to play. And he, so he says, all right, well, and he played some of the new tunes, and I played them right out. It is cool. And then we played, and they were fooling around with something, and they started playing Kathy's Waltz, and I jumped on that one. And then uh, uh, there was another, I forget which one, other one we did of his tunes, but I jumped on that one too and played that with him. And uh, I even would freak them out once in a while, which Joe Morello told me later did freak him out. And a couple of other gigs we did for the CNI Dog Foundation with the original quartet, uh -huh. to raise money for them. Where he says when he was playing and he closed his eyes, and get, kind of get into it, because I would emulate Paul, he really would get like this bizarre <laughs> feeling for a second of being back. Wow. You know, one of those type of numbers. But. Uh, Basically, then we started fooling around with standards and doing a bunch of things. And whatever he wanted to play, I played. I didn't care what key. We didn't talk about keys. He says, all right, you got the gig. You know, wow. This is great. You know, So I left. I never asked him about the bread, ever. <laughs> didn't ask when I got the call for my first gigs. I went out and played them. Didn't ask until you know I got my checks in the mail. I had no idea what I was going to make. It made no difference whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. None whatsoever. And uh, that was a major break. Uh, Playing with Doc Severinsen, that was a good, mm -hmm. that was a major break, you know, with the Tonight Show band. I sat it. I was in the orchestra here in Buffalo back, you know, just as a contract player, and then he hears me play, and the cats all in his band knew me, but he then he hears me blow the solos, and all of a sudden he falls in love. Now the next time he comes back to Buffalo, there's four saxophone solos that he's put in there because he knows I'm here, huh. and he's asking for me. Now he takes me out to do a couple of other orchestra dates with him in mm -hmm. other cities, and then asked me if I wanted to do the Tonight Show Band when they take it on the road. I said, yeah, hell yes. And I get to go out on the road on a bus and hang out with Conti Condoli, uh, Snooky Young, yeah. uh, you know, all the cats, the real deal. I mean, these cats have been doing it for ages. They got stories, they got, I mean, just ridiculous. Just ridiculously fun hang, and the second time I go out, who's playing the other tenor chair is Ernie Watts, and I'm like, you know, I, I transcribed your stuff, and I, I got tunes that you wrote that I've done out when you were with Grusin and doing all that stuff with Grusin and everything else, and so we started playing, and we Doc, of course, he's got two shooters here, so he's gonna give us a tune where the two of us blow and blow off each mm -hmm. other and do the whole thing. And we do that thing, and it was so out. I automatically, my because of my ears, I will try and cop the style of what I hear. Right? Uh -huh. He does the same thing. He's copied me, and I've <laughs> never heard anybody do it. I've never heard anybody do that. It was so funny. It was great. Wow. Yeah. So that was a major. That was a wow. that was a really nice one. That well, gosh, nice if you one. ever had anything that went terribly bad, <laughs> no. That's good. No, all your prep, all that preparation paid musically, off. Musically, never. I've left things that I didn't like. Yeah. But musically, never. Uh -huh. I've never had one go bad on me, or one that I couldn't do. Yeah. Uh, whether it was R and B, funk, whatever it was, I could still do it. But uh, um, preference now is Bob, or you know, getting a little out here and there. But uh -huh. the preference is Bob. But no, I've never had anything go bad. The, uh, when I did the album on Motown in, in uh, 83, it was uh, Bobby M. Blow. Mm -hmm. And it was sort of a, it was a funk R&B record. And when I first got the contract, when Rick got me that contract, I have all these grandiose ideas of my fusion band being, you know, recording my fusion band. And then Lenny White became the producer, which Rick got for me. And we took all those fusion tunes and turned them into R&B. Mm -hmm. And uh, I saw the writing on the wall, and actually at one point, my brother, we were in the studio here in Buffalo, uh, just working on the tunes and making the transitions. And uh, at one point I went outside, and I was almost having like a panic attack. And uh, I started crying. I looked at my brother, I says, I don't think this is right. I know the the, the, the truth of the matter is Motown won't know what to do with a jazz product, mm -hmm. a, a fusion jazz even product. They won't know what to do with it because they don't have anything like it on their label. So I could give them something and then it could be wonderful and it'll probably do nothing. So, but if I 
give it an R and B touch, then they can deal with it. I mean, they can put it out. Yeah. So I I know the business of what I'm talking about, but I feel like I'm bastarding my craft. I worked for two and a half years on this book of tunes, and they're great. I went with a business decision. Mm -hmm. We're going to go the whole way. We're going to switch it over. We're going to make it R&B. I'm going to blow funky, less notes, do the whole bit. And uh, it did very well, actually. But uh, my brother could never understand this in my nature. Uh, but I didn't want to do a second. They didn't pick up a second anyways. But I wouldn't have done a second. Uh -huh. And I decided, and my brother said, well, geez, I mean, you could be rich. I mean, you could do this well. And I said, I know I can do it well, but now that I've done it, I have to do it. Because that's what the people hear, the record. So now I have to play that. I said, but I don't want to play that anymore. Once in a while, I like it. One tune, cool. Two tunes, cool, because I enjoy playing funk. But as a career, mm -hmm. no. I said, but yeah, but said, no, you don't understand. It's got nothing to do with money, Michael. You don't play jazz for the money. And he just couldn't see that. There's, oh, I sing very well. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm lucky, but I sing very well. And I've got a kind of a style from Mark Murphy and Carmen McRae that I've kind of meshed together. Uh -huh. And uh, every time I sing, people flip. But I'll only sing one tune a set. Mm -hmm. Maybe two at the most, but most of the time just one tune a set. Or I sing at weddings. When I do weddings for my friends, I sing yeah. all the Sinatra tunes and swing stuff. Well, Without fail, I mean, people have offered to back me on a record where I sing, and my brother says, you got to sing more tunes in the set, you know, you draw more people. And Michael, if I do that, then I become the singer that plays saxophone. Uh -huh. I said, that's not what I want to be. I want to play my horn. Yeah. You know, so, you know, don't... Uh, well, it's a good, th you know, to have your priorities and orders. Yeah, it's important. not about the bread. Everything yeah. can't be about the money. <laughs> It just can't, not especially not this, not, not our craft. I mean, that's yeah. what you do. It can't be about the bread. Yes, you want to make it. Yes, you want to be successful. But I'll be damned if, you, if your criteria is how much money you make, you will not play the same. You know? Mm -hmm. Some of the best playing I've ever done. There's gigs for free with Bill Holman in L.A. or something where, or where you're working for the door and you made seven bucks. Mm -hmm. You know? So that's some of the best playing you did for 12 people. You know, or something yeah. like that, you know, where you broke these things and played wonderful. Or in the rehearsal room with Bill one day, I remember flipping everybody out on a couple of solos on Blue Daniel and something else and knocked everybody out. There was, there was no bread. It was get in the space every time you blow. That's uh -huh. the important thing. You know? wow. Well, speaking of money, what, um, what's it like to own a, a, a club? These Speaking days. of money and how it goes away, <laughs> yeah. um, it's great. It, it was an ego trip. I mean, basically, it's based owning a club and like the Trelf and doing what I do is based basically on my player's ego. I seen that club since its inception. I was there when it was first opened. And as a matter of fact, before it was opened, when it was down downstairs on Fillmore and Main Street. I played there in seventy. Gosh, I don't know, 77? The old one, in the basement. downstairs, that's yeah. right, with Ed, Ed, Ed Lawson. Right. Yeah, sure. And so, I mean, I knew what his vision was, and I could see it, and he was cool as hell. He just wasn't a very good businessman. Uh -huh. But it was the right thing to do. He knew how to make a jazz club, and he loved the art. And that's one of the things that's like lacking in a lot of places that are supposedly jazz clubs or mm -hmm. music clubs. The person that owns it really has no idea they really yeah. don't. They hire a buyer, they do whatever, they do this. Thing. The end grain of the club then reflects that to me. But uh, I had seen it uh, teeter and, and fail through the course of the 22 years, that, 23 years that it was uh, in its location now that I have. I've had it for seven, the twelve. And uh, all the way along the way, I've always been a businessman. I've always had uh, uh, a propensity towards being able to do business well and understand its concepts. Worked for my brother and different people and done other things, road managing Maynard. Mm -hmm. uh, myself, personally, I always did my books meticulously and always learned more about accounting and 
things and stuff like that. It was just the way I work. Always use computers and uh, always tried to make the most out of what I had and never looked at living on, you know, uh, I'm a self-employed musician. So that means the money I make this week isn't necessarily the money I have to spend this week. <laughs> and I've always looked at an amortized situation. So it's always been there. <clears throat> so now the trail comes up uh, and I had moved back to Buffalo and I have the restaurant across the street, the Bijou Grill with my family. I had invested in that a long time ago. And this comes up and I don't know, it was the mood I was in. I moved Dave and I got a lot of things happening and everything else, but I said, I want to do this. This can be done right. This can make money and it can make people proud and happy in the city. So I went ahead and did it and uh, a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And I didn't make a dollar out of that place for the first uh, almost four years. It was only putting money in. Yeah. Uh, but it was a labor of love. I knew I could do what it was. I could create my vision of the perfect club. And I did. The sound system is perfect. Literally perfect. It's, go it's gorgeous. And... Uh, uh, the atmosphere is right, and the customer service is AAA. Mm. And then my challenge was to build a team of people that could run it so I could keep staying on the road. Right. Because I told them all, and I've told, I continue to tell them in meetings, I'm a musician first. This is what I do. I'm gone. When the gig comes along, I'm gone. So yeah. you know, if it's seven weeks in Europe, which is going to be in 10 days, if, if it's going to, you know, if it's any of those things, that's what it is. So now you have to make it work. And I'm always there with email, my European cell phone, my regular cell phone, my whatever. I'm there to answer the questions and deal with anything that has to be done. So don't take me out of the loop. And I have my opinions and will, you know, assert my opinions as time goes on. But in the meantime, you know what I want. You have to learn what it is that I would want to do and you have to do that even mm -hmm. if you don't think it's what you would do. Wow. And that's what they do. Customer service is AAA over there. People enjoy it. We come up with some good deals for people and we keep our prices Buffalo real. Yeah. Well, including uh, <coughs> your, your performing experience and seeing it from the club owner side, what's your opinion on the state of jazz in this country these it's days? Great. You think it's great. State of jazz is wonderful. Oh yeah, yeah. oh yeah. Uh, those people who think that jazz is still in its demise and, and whatever, well, I mean, it's always been the, uh, the small demo. I mean, it's, it's always been that 3% of the record yeah. buying market. And, and uh, you know, and of that, the 3%, they include fusion and, and rock and funk and everything else in that 3%. So take even a smaller percentage of that for really aesthetically yeah. Uh, correct or whatever jazz you know right. real jazz I mean nothing wrong with fusion stuff especially played well Chick Corea's electric band is a wonderful experience to mm -hmm. you know to listen to I love them and there's been a whole bunch of fusion I've loved in my whole life so I'm not putting down fusion but uh, that 3% probably 1% of that or 33% of that 3% one percent is basically really jazz, the the the, the yeah. real you know traditional jazz. Right. So, who are we trying to fool here? I mean, we're not trying to become the the populist music. We never we were the popular music when it was big band swing. We were the rock and roll of that era. Okay, that was what that was. But once rock and roll came into play, then that changed. Right. Okay. Then we were moved out of the slot. And uh, now we can accept 1%. I'll be damned if a car manufacturer can get 1% of the U.S. sales of all cars. I'd be a multimillionaire. Mm. Well, there's nothing wrong with being 1%. Nothing wrong with that at all. The, 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 uh, the fact is there's more jazz. There's jazz festivals sold out everywhere. Newport sells out every single year because we play it. Um, most of the concerts at Carnegie Hall and in Lincoln Center and those kind of places are sold out every time you play them or every time you see them. Uh, sometimes good reviews, sometimes bad reviews, but who listens to reviewers? Hmm. You know, I mean, really, <laughs> if you, you become more of an art music, 
I'm not sure I'm saying that right, but it's been uh, culturally certainly elevated. Mm -hmm. And it's in all the schools now. And, you know, you can go to universities and stuff. Well, that's the reason why I think it's growing. It's actually growing. It's getting bigger all the mm -hmm. time because the schools have had this music in it since I was in high school, or grammar yeah. school. You know, so its effect is taking hold, and that is a whole series of two generations, maybe three generations of kids have now been exposed to jazz in school, and of those kids, maybe only, uh, you know, let's say 3% of them really dig it, then that's their mainstay music. But they all have an appreciation for it, because they all played the big band swing tunes in high school bands, and mm -hmm. they all played uh, whatever fusion charts and everything were written, you know, Bob Mincer charts and all the other yeah. things that were written. They all played all this stuff. So they have an appreciation for it, and they come out to see the gigs now, and they come out to see the players. They enjoy doing that, and they're open to the, you know, being exposed to jazz. I think, you know, you're seeing more people. We sell out everything with Dave. I mean, I. On a scale of one to ten, nine point five of the gigs are completely sold out, wow. full of That's kids. Great. Kids coming up to me all the time, and I heard your solo on this, and I heard your solo on that, and wow, what this is, what that is. And these are kids that are it's an eighty-two year old guy. It used to be, you know, a while ago. I mean, when I first started with Dave twenty-one years ago, uh, sometimes you'd meet a kid who didn't even know who Dave Brubeck was, right? Because it was. An extension of an era. I mean, we moved a shift there, and this kid was before that. You know? Right. Uh, but very seldom do you meet anybody who doesn't know who Brubeck is now. And the amount of kids, again, that have supposed it, I think we've got a growth of jazz that's wonderful in the United States. I don't think it's negative in any way, shape, or form. The only thing is that's negative about it is the people who write about it and talk about it and that kind of a thing who perceive it still as the underground and why can't jazz do so much better and why did, well, God, I mean, geez, guys like Sonny Rollins and anybody who's been around for a long time are making great bread out there right mm -hmm. now. They're doing fine. They're selling out everything that they do. They can't work enough gigs. Brubeck right now, we turn down almost as I'll much bet. as we take. Uh, you know, uh, I'm sure Wynton Marsalis has no complaints. <laughs> yeah, I would think not. You know, I, just to wrap up here, I wondered if you can describe what you think of in when you solo. Is it, well, uh, what do you take into I've consideration? I've done this at clinics, and, and I've, I've, I've sort of come up with a way, of, an analogy at clinics to try and get kids into it, but I think of nothing. I, absolutely nothing. My best solos are in the black space, are in the void. You, if you're going to blow a, now this, uh, I'm going to say this, this isn't unequivocally correct. This is my view, okay? If you're going to blow a great solo, you can't have analytical thought get in your way. To me, you already have to know the changes and you already have to know what you're going to do. You have to allow your ears and your soul to absorb the vibe of the people around you in such a way that you react and they react instantaneous without thinking. And the only way that that happens is when you go into the space and allow yourself to be free inside the space. Um, and so for me, I start to blow and all I do is see nothing. I see a black space and I, I, can, I can see it. Now. I mean, you can close your eyes and see black, but I can see where I go right now and I can see it's got a depth to it. And I start to blow and I hear what I hear. As a matter of fact, I start to blow off of what I hear. And if there's nothing there, I still hear that. It becomes a different kind of sound. The space becomes a different kind of sound. For me, that's the best way to blow. I don't care what key I'm in. As a matter of fact, I don't want to think about what, even on blues, I will not think about the key because it has no real reason. I mean, there's no reason to think about what key I'm in. What, am I going to make a mistake? I mean, really, <laughs> give me a break. Everybody makes mistakes. 
So you don't care what key you're in, you don't care about anything like that. You care only about the space and the validity of the statements you make. It's like a, uh, oh, try and drive the car. All right, you go all the way back to when you first started to drive. You're taking mm -hmm. that first lesson. And they're telling you, okay, you got to look in this mirror, you got to look in that mirror, you got to look in this mirror. You got to look behind you, you got to put your seatbelt on. You got to, before you put it in the gear, you got to do this, you got to do that. When you depress the pedal, don't use both feet because if you use this, you'll ride the brake pedal. You got to right. do this. So you have all these rules. Now, when you get to the corner, look this direction before you do this, and always look to your left because traffic comes from this direction. So you look there first, then you look over here first. You have all these rules, right? Try driving the car and thinking about those. <laughs> you can't. Right. Try playing golf and trying to think about how you put your hands and what you do in the position of your shoulder and where your eyes are. No, that's for when you practice. But when you go to play the game, you're in the zone. When you go to drive the car, you're in the zone. You do it inherently because you've practiced enough to do it well. If you do it well, great. If you don't, you have an accident. If you don't, you don't hit the ball right. It slices to yeah. the right, or it doesn't do what it's going to do. But when you're in the zone, when you're truly doing the job, I'll defy anyone to say they were thinking about it when they did it. There's nothing there. It's the pure thought process. I'm right inside, and it's going direct. That's what I try and get across to the kids when we do clinics. I'm an ear player. I'm a soul player. That's where I give you what I play. So that's what makes the difference between somebody wants me to play on their movie score than somebody else because they know what I'm going to give that melody. Mm -hmm. It might be the same notes are there, but they know what I'm going to give it. Wow. And that's the difference. They want what I'm going to give it. So you have, you know, when I'm dealing with the kids, I mean, you, you, you have that ability to do this. So I make them close their eyes. I just did this at the University of the Pacific last week. Kids wanted to know how to play out. <laughs> and they yeah. could play. These were not like, yeah. these were the cream of the crop from around the country that yeah. University of the Pacific has a really unique program where they bring them in on a scholarship thing from all over the United States into one place and do a week of seminars. Christian yeah. McBride was there, a whole bunch, Brubeck, ourselves. You do seminars, things, work with the kids and everything. They put bands together. Wonderful program. So these kids, I got a quintet standing in front of me here. And, he said, play me something. And he picked a tune, uh, I think it was Morning Sunrise or whatever. That, uh, something is a morning sunrise. Softly in a morning sunrise. Softly yeah. in a morning sunrise. I think that's the one they picked. So they started to play the tune, and I listened to, how do you want to start this? What do you want to do? And they started the tune, and I listened to it. I said, cool, okay. All right. Let's do it again. Only this time, everybody close your eyes. I want to sit quiet for a minute, just quiet. I want the bass player, drummer, anybody who feels like starting to play, do not think about that melody. Don't think about what key you're going to be in. Don't think about anything. I don't care if you just want to make noises. Just I want somebody to start something at any point in time. But I want us to sit here for about two minutes with our eyes closed. I said, I just, and then I want anybody join them and anybody else join mm -hmm. them and anybody else join them. And once you're together as a composite, and everybody's kind of blowing, and if you don't feel like getting in there, don't. But I said, once you're together and you got the swirl happening, and you got something going on, you know where you're going. You know the melody of the tune, you know the rough tempo that you want to be at. Anybody start. Anybody start time or start the melody. So make a long story short, I mean, it was a little more explanation in there than that. So I sit back and make everybody sit there with their eyes closed. Which was fun, too, because these young kids, none of them started giggling or anything. Yeah. Or, yeah. Only the one girl was self-conscious. Mm -hmm. Other than that, everybody was pretty into it. So then, the bass player started, and the piano started to just tinkle like minor seconds, just these little minor second things. Within a short period of time, there was this beautiful conclave of sounds that didn't have a center, but it just was beautiful. And then out of there, the horn player started to say it, uh -huh. just loose, without time. And they sort of implied the change. The thing came out. The bass player started to lay down a little bit of time. Before you know it, they were into the tune. 
and a better, much better tempo than they picked the first time. Uh -huh. They played through the whole thing. Their solos started to do the same thing with, uh, with the drummer was taking it out. I mean, things were going on. And then when they finished the tune, they took it out the same way. <laughs> and I didn't tell them to do that. Yeah. They just took it out the same, they let it just kind of disintegrate. And it was cool, when they finished, they looked up at me and they all started laughing. And they had this, first they had this serious look on their faces yeah. and they all started laughing. I says, you guys got out there, didn't you? And they said, yeah. yeah. And so I says, cool, <laughs> that's jazz, dude. You know, because right now, you can't do that tomorrow again. Uh -huh. You can't do it the same way. Right. That's jazz. Don't Great. try and do it the same way. Don't ever, ever try and play it the same way. Try and play it different. Today you'll do it real good, tomorrow you won't. So what? Yeah. Well, there you go. That's some great words of wisdom. And I, yeah, yeah. Well, it's been really fascinating. It's been my pleasure. I've been pleased to meet you, and you got, you got your act together in a number of venues, yeah. and so I look forward to visiting your club sometime. And Anytime. Hearing yeah. you with Brubeck. Yeah, tonight would be a good night. Yeah. All right. There's a lot of good acts down there. Great. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you.